Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Taylor Clem. I'm with UF IFAS Extension, Nassau County. I am the Horticulture Extension Agent, Master Gardener Volunteer Coordinator, County Extension Director, um, and one of the programs I really like to teach about and talk about is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program because it's our statewide program. Every county you go to throughout the state, we're going to be talking about the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, which essentially is a nine principle program that's all about how we protect Florida's resources, natural resources, by making sure that we're managing our lawns and landscapes as appropriately as possible. So today's program is one of our many, we do quarterly programs that all fall within this, what I call the Florida Friendly Landscaping Crash Course, where we kind of like jump into the basic nuts and bolts of the FFL program. And today's quarterly program, we're calling from the ground up because we're going to put a lot of emphasis, you know, when we talk about the FFL program, we talk about right plant, right place. We talk about the beautiful plants and trees and shrubs and, you know, how we're, maybe how we're irrigating, if we're irrigating, if we have to use nutrients, how we're using nutrients. But one of the most commonly forgotten concepts or things that we think about within our landscapes is soil. The power of soil. Soil is such an important component of our landscapes that, um, if we can manage our soils or think about how we're managing our soils, we can have an incredibly healthy, robust lawn, landscape, farm, agriculture, vegetable bed, you name it. Soil is the root of everything. So if we talk about the FFL program, we're going to talk about from the ground up. So we're going to talk about the soils today as part of our FFL program and well, soils in the context of the FFL program. So let's go ahead and get going. I always like to ask questions at the beginning of my program. And my goal is by the time you get through uh, this program together, you'll be able to answer these three big questions. What is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program? Why is soil important in my landscape? And what are ways to improve soil in my landscape? So let's start from the beginning. Let's start at the very beginning, the big picture. I really like this picture. I actually got some of these slides from one of my friends because I liked using it within this PowerPoint. Um, and we talk about everything in the Florida Finland Landscaping Program, especially in Florida, if we're talking about the ground up, water is a significant component of our lawn and landscape. Um, so the big picture, only less than 1% of the water on the planet Earth is readily available for human use. And when we start thinking about how water is being used and some of the, the pollutants that might impact us from things like nitrogen and phosphorus, um, you know, we have to be very careful because if only 1% is used for human, human use, then uh, we need to be very considerate in how we're managing and taking care of our water resources. And in Florida, it was just so unique. You know, here's a picture. Uh, this is from an artist, photographer, John Moran. And this is the Florida aquifer. Florida aquifer, we're directly connected. The surface and the aquifer, we are interconnected. This is from one of the spring. I can't remember exactly which spring this is from. But um, this just kind of shows, you see scuba divers, they're diving down into a sink or a hole, a spring. And then they're entering the Florida aquifer. Our aquifer is directly connected to our water. It's all connected. It's like we're sitting on a giant thing of Swiss cheese because we have these big caves and caverns and all this fresh water is sitting within them. And we're able to use those. But at the same time, we have to be very careful because just as easily it is for us to access it, it's just as easily for us to unintentionally pollute or cause some issues to our natural resources. Um, so it's really important that we're thinking that we're always connected to the water throughout the state, no matter where. So when we're thinking about not only how connected we are to the water, we're also considering how much the water that we're using. So um, when we look at, this is, a, this is from 2005, water use has changed significantly, um, you know, in the past 15 years. We can actually see how within the northern part of the state, how water is predominantly being used, whether it be domestic self-supply, so that's like a well, agriculture and golf, industrial, mining, thermoelectric, or public supply. Um, and you can definitely see in Nassau County, predominantly that is industrial. Um, I'm assuming that has to relate with the paper mill plants and everything like that. Um, but 
Um, but I wish we had the total quantities on here. That's one thing I don't like, it's just in percentages, not total usage. Uh, but anyways, um, we're seeing groundwater being used and predominantly we use a lot of it and a lot of it is being used within our residential landscapes, whether it be well or municipal supplies, et cetera. Um, but when we actually look at that residential use, we actually see that from a study, um, and this has been study done multiple times, but continuing, we're seeing that approximately 60% of residential water use is attributed to the landscape or outdoor use. And that's a lot of water. So um, from one of the reports from the University of Florida and some other partners, I like this quote, it says the single most effective strategy to reduce water demand in Florida is to reduce the amount of water used for landscape irrigation. And that's true. Um, and a lot of the problems that we see within our landscapes come back to overwatering um, and that can have an impact on our soil. So, um, so when we're thinking about the FFL program, we think about water and it's important to water quality. So, and we actually have some impaired water bodies within Nassau County. Um, honestly, they're not, we don't have any majorly impaired bodies, which is actually really nice. Um, and you can actually go to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and actually look at a map and seeing what watersheds or what water bodies are impaired within your area. Um, and ours that we see are predominantly going to be, you're going to have some that are impaired from nitrogen and phosphorus and other from fecal coliform. And fecal coliform is usually attributed to septic systems. Um, it could be agriculture. It could be um, dog waste. There's a lot of dog waste that ends up in our water bodies. So, but when we look at like nutrients and fertilizers, a lot of it comes from fertilizer, or sorry, nutrients in our water bodies, like the nitrogen and phosphorus, comes from like fertilizers, from agriculture, urban landscapes, stormwater runoff, wastewater systems, um, septic systems in addition to. So um, there's all these different things can impact our water quality. But anyway, so how does this relate to Florida and how does it relate to Florida Friendly Landscaping Program? So the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program ultimately comes back to how we're conserving water and using water and our natural resources within our landscapes. So the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, in a nutshell, is our, it, we say, an integrative approach to maintaining an attractive, colorful, and diverse yard. It's friendly to wildlife, it's environmentally responsible, and it can be significantly less work than a traditional landscape, depending on some of the decisions that you make, but on average, they're gonna be significantly less. Um, and a nice thing about the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, it's, it's not necessarily telling you how your yard has to look or what it needs to look like. It's more of a set of management guidelines on if you're going to be having a landscape by following these different principles, you can help reduce the inputs into your landscape. You get to enjoy your landscape more and work less, and it helps protect Florida's natural resources. So to help do that and communicate that, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program has nine guiding principles. So those nine principles are right plant, right place, water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, mulch, attract wildlife, manage yard pests, recycle, reduce stormwater runoff, and protect the waterfront. So um, how many of you have never heard of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program before? Or are you familiar with it, but you're not sure exactly what it is? Go ahead and you can just put that in the chat box. Only I'm the one that's able to see your responses. Is this new to anybody? This is nice. We have some people that's more uh, familiar with the program than not. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so one individual, they've heard of the program, but they're not too sure about the implementation. Perfect. So these programs are great ways. Uh, this program is a great way to kind of just get an introduction to some of those best management practices. Um, yeah, and so we'll talk more about these these details. And also another great thing is if you're always trying to figure out more specific details and how to manage your landscapes within this, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program like guidelines or our best management practices, you just got to reach out to me, um, our Master Gardener volunteers as well. I'll have our contact at the end of the PowerPoint.
But anyways, so these are our nine principles that guide our statewide program. And it's not just for homeowners. We're seeing green industry professionals. This is the same thing. We're starting to communicate with community, asso community association managers, planners, builders, developers, et cetera. These are our nine guiding principles. But from the perspective of thinking about from the ground up, and soils and the importance of soils within our landscapes, we're actually just gonna focus on three of these principles today. So the three principles that we're gonna focus on are right plant, right place, mulch, and recycle. And all of these quarterly programs, I always use right plant, right place. Because right plant, right place is essentially the first step in making sure you're maintaining strong, healthy, happy landscape that is very resilient. Um, so we'll jump into each one of these as to pertain to why they um, relate to the soil and from the ground up. But very briefly, the right plant, right places, if we take plants and put them in the environment that they prefer, so some plants prefer full sun, sun some prefer full shade, others love moisture, some don't like it at all. So if we're making sure that like in our landscape or in our yard, if we have a location that might be part shade and has lots of moisture, then let's pick a plant that loves part shade and lots of moisture. Because the minute that we start to put plants into these conditions that they don't like to live in, they're gonna be stressed. And the minute those plants become stressed, no matter what it is, it's gonna have have increased pest issues. That's like fungal pathogens. Insects are going to come in and start munching on it, causing some issues. Or you may even see some nutrient deficiencies. So some different like colorations that are happening within the plants and they don't look too well, which then makes them or healthy. And then it makes them a little bit weaker, a little bit weaker. So right plant, right place. If we follow those guidelines, we can be very, very successful in our landscape. And part of Right Plant, Right Place is also thinking about our soil conditions. And we'll talk a lot more about our soil conditions. Mulch is really, you know, how are we, how can mulch become a strong component in our landscape? Because it can help with protecting against uh, weeds, can help with soil moisture retention, it can help maintain soil pH. So what kind of mulches work best for us? How do we use them within our landscape? Um, and then lastly, recycle. How are we recycling the uh, plant material within our landscapes? Because that can help build our healthy soils that can help give us these benefits of having a strong healthy soil and it can help provide a much stronger healthier landscape so we'll talk more about recycling and how we can do basic recycling within our landscape if you know like most common thing we think about recycling within our landscape might be compost but you may not have the capacity to do composting so we'll talk about some really cool strategies on how we can recycle with our landscapes because if we build our soils again we're going to have a really healthy landscape that's very resilient and doesn't require too many inputs from us to help maintain it so let's talk about soil the dirt on soil so I always say dirt is what you get on your pants. So it's a mis, you know, say someone will dig a hole and like, oh, I got, look at all this dirt. It's not dirt. Dirt is what you get on your pants. It's soil. Soil is what we have below our feet. So um, I always like to mention that nonetheless, but let's talk a little bit about the basics of soil, the very basics of soil. So um, when we look at soil, we think about soil texture. So soil texture is actually like, you know, you may go to one place, it might be a lot of sand. Some might have different colors. It might not see sandy. Or if you like go up north, you're going to have a lot more clays in your soil. So how we decide or determine soil texture is the combination of the three major or the three soil components. So major components, and that's like sand, silt, and clay, and they're predominantly determined based off of their particle size. So sand is the largest. Um, uh, silt is going to be um, the medium, and clay is the very fine, very, very small particles. And our soil texture is essentially that mixture, those ratios, that combination of all those that we get put together. So um, from y'all's perspective, just taking a wild guess, because you may or may not know, if you were going to look at that image on the right, 
that is showing like all these different types of soil textures and like the very basic nomenclature that we use for them, like clay, sand, sandy loam, loam, etc. If you were to find a soil type for Florida, where do you think is our most predominant? What do you think is our most predominant soil type? And you can put that guess in the uh, chat box. Mm, that's pretty good. <laughs> so we had one vote for loamy sand. That's pretty good. Does anybody else think loamy sand? This is a wild, this is a wild guess. If you're not sure, it's just a, it's a shot in the dark. One response I really, I think is pretty funny is bad soil. Um, that's, partially true. I don't want to say we have bad soil. Our soil is hard to deal with if you're not used to it. That's, I think, the most appropriate way to put it, is our soil, our ecosystem is great for our soils. Um, our, sorry, our soils are great for our natural ecosystems, but if we're wanting to bring in like non-native plants or um, trying to do like vegetable gardens or specific ornamental plants, it can be a little bit tougher, really can be. So <laughs> I like that response. Uh, but anyway, or that's a funny response. But um, Florida, actually, we're kind of like within this area. Uh, we have these sandy, these sandy clay loams, sandy loams, loams. Our loams are going to be a little bit deeper in the soil. Um, you know, we also can have areas that just hunt like just straight sand, just straight, straight sand. And it's usually going to be along like those coastal areas, those dune areas, et cetera. Uh, but as you look down through the depths of the soil, that can actually change a little bit of like what that texture might be. But it's important to consider what does, why, why is that important? Why does it matter? You know, soil texture can actually determine nutrient availability. So if we're putting fertilizers out, you know, how well can that soil actually hold on to those nutrients or that moisture to allow for those plants to be able to uptake it? Um, so soil texture can determine or influence nutrient availability, moisture retention. Um, it can impact habitat. So what kind of plants can grow? It can impact drainage. How well does water move through it? Like you all know, if you have pure sand water, you don't even see it. It just disappears right through it. But if you start to have more loams or clay, or silt and clay um, within your soil, you're gonna start seeing that moisture maybe sit a little bit longer. But then also influences like pH buffering or um, it can impact just the overall pH of our soils to a certain extent. So soil significantly influ influences our landscapes. So when we think about plant material choice, we are talking about right plant, right place, right? So some plants have specific nutrient needs. Are those plants, are those nutrients going to be available? You know, the soil can help influence that. Moisture retention, you know, if some a landscape can drain really well or hold on to moisture really well, so that's going to impact the type of plants that we can put in there. Um, and then also that soil type is going to actually have a huge, like I mentioned, a huge significant um, determinant on the type of habitat that we can grow. So our natural ecosystem. So it's kind of, it's really interesting that we think about, you know, because this might not always be at the top of our minds when we're thinking about managing our landscapes, but our soils are wildly important. So let's look at a soil profile because soil is more than just what's happening at the surface. In general, our soil profile, when we think about soils, we're thinking about how that soil changes as we get deeper and deeper and deeper. So we have different uh, soil layers within our landscape. So if you went out into your yard or your backyard and you just dug straight down, a big hole straight down, and you look at that soil, you'd actually see different layers that begin to look like like layers of a cake, layers of an onion, if you're a Shrek fan. Um, but anyways, we classify these different areas and these different soil horizons. Um, so as we're seeing them, these different soil types change, we have these different 
demarcations that we use to identify them. Um, they can get very complicated. I can never remember all of them, but the most basic ones are the ones that you see here. So we have the O horizon, the A horizon. So we have O, A, E, B, C, and R. Um, they are the most basic soil horizons that we see um, in our landscapes and the most upper highest layer is that O layer and that's organic, the hummus. So that is where, and we'll talk a little bit more about these, but that's that uppermost layer, the upper uppermost layer of our soils. But because of Florida's soil type, we typically have very thin or very, very low organic matter. In some areas I have seen it where there is no organic matter at all. Um, and just below that organic matter, we have that topsoil. That's that rich organic matter. Um, and then E is kind of this area that we call it area of leaching. That's just where things like begin to just, you're out of the root zone of plants, a lot of the plants and you, those nutrients or moisture starts to move down below further into the soil to what we call is that zone of accumulation, B, and that's outside of your root zones, just period. And then you can get start to get down to that bedrock, that C, that unbroken rocks, or R, that parent material bedrock. So, um, but when we think about Florida soils, it's like, yeah, we may not have much of an O or an A sometimes. It exists, but it's it can be very minimal in some areas. Um, but when we look at a typical Florida soap, uh, Florida soil profile, this is what it looks like. This is the state soil. Pop quiz. Does anybody know the name of Florida's state soil? You put that in the chat, chat box if you know. Oh yeah, it's a it's a weird one. Once you, some of you may know this term though, it is Mayaka soil. So it's Mayaka, M Y A K K A. So some of you all may know like Mayaka River, really really cool place to go um, down in Central Florida. But it's the Mayaka soil series, which makes up about I think it's a uh, I pulled it up. Hold on, it makes up about one and a half million acres of Florida's soil. <laughs> so that's our state soil. This, this is Mayaka soil. We have that O layer, which you may not be able to see very much of. And then you have that top soil, which is very, very thin. Um, that's A. And uh, then you have that, um, the zone where everything starts to percolate and infiltrate the zone through and zone B is you have that zone of accumulation. And when you're looking at this, you can actually see these different layers. And this is a pretty common soil profile for throughout the state. Um, so it is kind of neat. Oh, you're seeing my Google screen. There we go. Sorry, I did pull that up though, so you got to see that. <laughs> but anyway, so the Mayaka soil um, is, is it better now? You're back on the PowerPoint. Okay, so, um, but the Mayaka soil series, you have that thin layer of that organic, the, uh, another thin layer of that A, that top soil, that, and then that zone E, that's where everything starts to like move through to that zone accumulation, that area B. So, um, but you can find some soil profiles that get very complicated where it's like A1, A2, and then there's a bunch of other letters that you can get. Um, and I have a book up there that goes through all of them, but I can never remember them off the top of my head, <laughs> nonetheless. So, um, but when we think about our soils, that O layer, that O layer becomes one of the most critical, that O and that A, but the O layer, let's talk a little bit about that because that top uppermost part of our soils is very, very important because it can help stabilize our soil pH. So, so many plants like you know, uh, may or may not know, need specific soil pH. 
um, they have a specific range of pH that they prefer. And if we start to fall outside of that pH range, then um, it can make it harder for plants to uptake nutrients. Or if you have a very acidic soil, you may want to put plants in that prefer very acidic soils. Or if you have a very alkaline soil, you can uh, you may want to choose plants that have a very alkaline soil. And you and if you're not sure what your, your soil pH is, you can always bring soil samples to our office and we can actually do that soil pH test for you. So we can talk about soil amendments, how to improve your soil, your soil structure um, to help create a healthier landscape. Um, so soil pH is really important, but then the uppermost layer, it, that O layer, it can help stabilize soil pH or influence our soil pH. Um, it can actually help supply nutrients through what we call a cation exchange capacity. Um, which we'll go a little bit more in detail in a couple seconds. It can help maintain soil structure. Um, and maintaining soil structure is essentially like the aggregate sizes, the diversity of aggregate sizes within your soil that can actually lead to a much, much, much healthier soil. It can help supply energy essentially, and it can remove um, harmful pollutants from the soil. So one of the biggest ones that we always talk about or think about, at least within regards of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is obviously soil pH. We also talk about how that soil can help with the supply of nutrients through cation exchange capacity. So um, there is a really cool video that I want to show you all because I think it does a much better job at um, explaining cation exchange capacity. So let me get this moving. Okay. Let me know if you can hear this. Not all soils are created equal. And if it weren't... Whoops, I apologize. For chemistry, we wouldn't be able to grow many crops here, nor here, nor here. It's like this. Soils are composed of sand, silt, clay, and organic matter. Some have more sand, others more clay. Each soil's unique blend determines its color, texture, and storage capacity for nutritious chemicals. Although incredibly small, nutrients still need their space. And by space, we mean the area surrounding the soil's tiny particles. Keep in mind that surface area is not the same as particle size. For example, clay particles are tiny compared to sand but they have more than a thousand times as much external surface area as the particles in an equal volume of sand. However, if a nutrient just sits there unattached, it will likely leach out from the soil when it rains and will not be available for plants. Remember that time when you rubbed a balloon on your best friend's hair and stuck it to a wall? Well, a similar phenomenon occurs in the soil. Through their electrostatic energy, nutrients cling on to clay particle surfaces. Nutrients like calcium, magnesium, potassium, and ammonium are all positively charged chemicals, or cations. And as it turns out, most clay particles and organic matter in soil are negatively charged. So, many nutrients are positive and particles are negative. Perfect. In chemistry, as in romance, opposites attract. Good. No more leaching. But like the balloon on the wall, the nutrients are only temporarily held. In fact, there's actually a shell of water molecules that forms around the cation, preventing it from bonding permanently. This shell is often called a hydration sphere. But that's a whole other video. So back to cations. Basically, if a plant wants a nutritious cation like potassium, it will need to exchange it for another cation or cations of equal charge. Luckily, plants produce hydrogen cations that they can exchange. One hydrogen cation for one potassium cation. Easy enough. But for nutrients with a positive charge of two, like calcium, two hydrogen cations are needed. The higher the positive charge, the harder it gets to exchange or trade cations. That's because a cation with high positive charge and small size is preferentially held by the soil over those with lower charge or larger size, meaning that a large cation with a positive charge of one will be the first to be released. A divalent cation having a charge of two will be released more easily than a cation with a positive charge of three. Whether they are held tightly or not, the nutrients are available to the plant in exchange for other cations. 
Not all nutrients are cations, however. Some are actually negatively charged compounds, or anions. Since anions, like nitrate or sulfate, have a negative charge, they are unable to attach themselves to negatively charged particles and, as a result, leach out when watered. Of course, all soils are different. There are soils in the tropics, for example, that have positively charged soil particles. And in that case, it's the anions, not cations, that are held temporarily and then exchanged with other anions. Most soils, however, have negatively charged particles. The more negatively charged a soil is and the more surface area a soil has, the more cation exchange capacity it has. This is such an important factor for plant growth that scientists measure a soil's cation exchange capacity CEC, in order to help farmers determine how much and how often fertilization is needed. That's because CEC is sort of like a cup size at a fast food joint. Some soils are supersized, but others have a kitty cup. Pouring too much will just cause a mess, but if you refill several times, you can still quench your thirst. Farming in low CEC soils works almost the same way. Even though the soil has lower capacity, you can fertilize more often using smaller amounts and the plants will grow healthy and strong. And it's a good thing, too. Otherwise, we'd have very little land to farm. So the fact that farmers can grow crops almost anywhere kind of seems like superhero powers. But really, it's just knowing about chemistry. All right. So what did you all think about that? What are some of your what are some of your thoughts? You can put that in the chat box. Yeah, it's a really cool video. Um, <laughs> I had a whole um, part of my soils classes during my undergraduate. And this video was able to explain CEC so much better to me within a couple minutes than a whole week's worth of classes. <laughs> so cation exchange capacity, it's a strange term you've probably never heard of before. Maybe you have, but it really impacts how we think about how well our soils can hold on to those nutrients and then help provide them to the plants. So based off of what you learned from that video, do you think Florida has a low cation exchange capacity or a high cation exchange capacity? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it has a low cation exchange capacity because we don't have too many clays. We don't end um, clay in our soils that's negatively charged. So um, what ends up happening is those cations can't hold on to our soils too much. Um, and then also we have so much sand, we have a lot less essentially surface area that those nutrients have the ability to hold on to. So it's really easy for us to put down nutrients or fertilizers in our um, landscapes. But if we don't, if we have a low CEC and then say rain comes in or we irrigate or something happens after we took down that fertilizer, what do you think happens? That's right. Yeah. So what we see is that, yeah, it all washes away. Essentially, those nutrients, those fertilizer will just wash away because um, they don't have the ability to hold on. And where do they end up going? They end up down in our water bodies. And like our nutrients, such as phosphorus and nitrogen, they're contributors to non-point source pollution, which can lead to the algal blooms that we have seen in a lot of our fresh water. They contribute towards algal blooms. Um, so it's really important that we're thinking about how we're using fertilizers appropriately within our landscapes and our soils is significantly in, significantly influence how well 
we can use those or how we're managing our soils, or sorry, how we're using our fertilizers within our landscapes. So, um, but why is this so important? So more about that O layer. So the O layer is very, very important because, you know, it is, on average, 5% of soil volume, but in Florida, it's only about 1% to 3% of Florida sandy soils. And even in a lot of our urban or disturbed areas, that doesn't even exist. I've seen a lot of soils where there is no such thing as an O layer um, in someone's soil because of where that soil disturbance occurred. So like say someone comes in and removes a, uh, a natural area and then you're doing some type of development on it, a lot of homes are built on just clean fill. So it's just sand and there is no organic layer in that. So in a lot of our urban areas, urbanizing areas, we have no, very low or none, no organic matter, yet we're managing some of our landscapes pretty intensively. So it can, imp it can impact um, the nutrient available to our plants, but also there's a lot of times that people might be putting down nutrients or fertilizers where it might end up going as a contributor to non-point source pollution, or you're putting down too much fertilizer where you're start wasting a lot of money. You're putting down fertilizer that your plants have no, do not have access to. So it's really important to think about the importance of that organic uh, layer. And there's a lot of new research that's going on. And we'll talk a little bit about it later on in the presentation on how we can improve organic layers or matter within our soils. But when we think about the organic layer of soils, when we just stop considering our soils and the importance that they have within our, and how we're managing agriculture and how we're managing our landscapes. You know, what is one thing that you think about in US history that relates to poor soil management? Here you go. <laughs> so the Dust Bowl, the Dust Bowl, a lot of it was contributed to poor soil management. We weren't helping build soil. We we're destroying a lot of that organic matter, um, intensive agriculture in such a way that it depleted that O layer, but we didn't help rebuild that soil structure, maintain that soil structure through that management. And it was pretty devastating. Um, luckily, you know, USDA and RCS, we've, and through research, there's been so many best management practices for agriculture to, and how we help build and protect our soils that we're now, you know, in the past 20, 25, 30 years, we're starting to say, okay, how do we bring these, actually the same type of, con the same type of information and we're bringing them in within these residential landscapes. So a dust bowl is a great example in American history where we had a huge impact based off of poor soil management. So if you want to know about your soils, like what kind of general soils you have, I really like this webpage. Uh, this is called the uh, Web Soil Survey. It's from USDA and NRCS. Um, I'll open it really quickly so you can see this. And um, I believe you should be able to see this. Can you see my web browser? All right. Do you have the ability to see my uh, web browser? Yes. Okay, perfect. So this is the Web Soil Survey web page, and it's kind of a clunky web page, but I really like it. Um, you know, I'll zoom in. I'll come over to our extension office here in Callahan. And you can find your property that you're wherever you're located at. So here we are. Um, I can actually find like select this area that I'm interested in. And very quickly, this is all very generic, generalized information because a lot of it has been changed so much over time. But I can actually look at my soil maps, which I think is crazy. So you see all these numbers that are on this screen that indicates what kind of soil I have within the area. And you can see how they have these unique names. But the most common one that we have in this area that I selected is this Goldhead Fine Sand. It's just a, a soil type 
Um, and you can actually click on this info and it actually gives you those uh, profile information. So we can actually see that the A layer is zero to eight inches. That's at fine sand and then zone E, eight to 33 inches is fine sand. And we actually get some clay loams uh, down 33 to 69 inches and then loam me fine sands. This is in this case in uh, C. So it's really interesting that you can pull up all this information about your property. Um, so you can find it and you can see kind of general soils that you have. So it's, 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 I think it's a neat little resource. Um, I use it for some of the clients when they reach out to extension office, depending on what the problem might be. But it's a cool thing to kind of, if you're curious about what soils you have within your area, this is a cool way to kind of pull it up. So anyway, so now let's talk about, you know, we talked about the, the basics of soils, you know, the cation exchange capacity, how they have those different soil profiles, and then the role that they play within help, helping regulate our landscapes, you know, like soil pH, um, the moisture retention, drainage capacity, et cetera. So now let's talk more about in that context of the right plant, right place. So again, we're gonna talk about these three key uh, principles, right plant, right place, mulch and recycle and how it relates to our soils. So we're talking about right plant, right place. You know, plants, like I mentioned earlier, they all rely on very specific uh, environmental conditions. They have preferred environmental conditions that they uh, want to thrive in, that they're happy in. So you want to make sure that you're planting those plants within those correct environmental conditions, and that includes our soils. So right plant, right place is if we um, are not thinking about our soil conditions, that's going to have a huge impact on the overall health and resiliency of our landscape plants because you know even like turf grass is a great example because turf grass is a pretty dominant crop species that we see all across uh, the United States especially in Florida um, and it doesn't like moisture it likes water but it doesn't like to have the soil hold it likes to get moisture and water but it doesn't like to have the soil hold on to moisture for very long because it can lead to fungal pathogens and it can cause it to decay and die and break down etc so um you know just think about that moisture retention how well does it drain the nutrients that are available so thinking that once we have a good understanding of our soil conditions as well it can help influence the type of plants that we can put into our landscapes. And this plant right here, I, this is coral ardesia, which is actually a very invasive noxious weed. Um, and I always like to show this picture just for the fact that we do have plants that grow really well in these specific environmental conditions, but there's some plants that just grow too terribly well, and they're non-native plants, and they can actually take over different parts of our ecosystems and disrupt that natural habitat, and coral ardesia is one of those. But with right plant, right place, you know, one of the big things that we can really test for is our soil pH. So like I mentioned earlier, is you can bring your soil to samples to our office, and we can do those pH tests for you. And I'll follow up with information because you can actually send soil samples to our state uh, plant, uh, soils lab, and they can give you recommendations on uh, potassium, magnesium, manganese, and other nutrients um, for your soils if there's a deficiency and the best recommendations at rates to apply them based off of whatever you're growing, whether it be ornamentals, vegetables, blueberries, turf grass. Um, and it's, that's a very helpful tool. So I'll make sure I send that all to you. So the next principle is mulch. So it's like, oh man, what kind of mulch? Some mulch are some types of mulch are really really nice, but some are not. I wouldn't recommend using some of our mulches uh, that you can easily get. But at the end of the day, mulch can be very beneficial when you have those bare open spaces within your landscape bed. Now, of course, shrubs will help fill in a lot of that space. And over time, that area that you ultimately need to mulch within your ornamental beds decreases because you have plants that are more mature. But when we do have those open spaces of soil, it can be really helpful to help uh, mulch those beds because it can, that mulch can help protect and enhance soil. A lot of our farmers will use cover crops and they'll use cover crops and they can grow cover crops between rows within their ag fields because what that'll do is that'll help stabilize that soil. So say you have a really, really windy day. 
um, that wind is going to blow away some of that sand if, if it is bare. But if you have like a cover crop or if you're a landscape and you have mulch, that, sand, that wind can come in and it'll help keep that soil there and it doesn't get blown away. So mulch can help protect and enhance the soil. So um, other ways they can protect the soil um, is it can help suppress weeds. So you're not having to um, put down herbicides or reduce the amount of herbicides or hand pulling of weeds that are within your landscapes. It can help regulate soil temperatures. So it can help make sure the soil doesn't get too hot in the summer or too cold in the winter. Um, and it can actually slow down evapotranspiration from the soil. So it helps with that soil moisture retention so our soils don't dry out too quickly. It can reduce your, it does reduce maintenance within your landscape and it can actually provide a nice little aesthetic value. But another really cool thing is as that mulch breaks down, it can help provide that organic matter back to your soil, which is a, a wonderful thing, you know, because again, if you, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you put down that mulch, you break it down, that mulch breaks down and starts to get this organic matter, fill up this A layer, all of a sudden you're going to help with that cation exchange capacity, that nutrient availability, the soil pH regulation. And um, so that's a really nice little benefit of mulch, but that's only if you're applying it appropriately. So usually I always say rule of finger. So only put your, your mulch down at a depth of two to three inches. If it's too shallow, it's not going to have that same benefit. Um, and some weeds will be able to pop through, but if it's too deep, it might actually hold on to too much moisture and it can lead to a lot of fungal concerns, fungal pathogens concerns. So I just usually like middle finger depth and that's pretty good. So, but what is appropriate mulch? So that's a big thing that we need to always consider when we're in our landscapes. Um, but, you know, mulch, I kind of really jumped the gun on what I was saying. So like, what is mulch? A mulch is applied to the soil surface to protect or improve our covered areas. So it has aesthetic qualities um, and it can be any material. There is good and bad um, soil that, I'm so, sorry, mulch that we can bring into our landscapes. Um, and these are those benefits that I mentioned. I really jumped the gun. <laughs> Not too bad though, but um, the mulch can, other benefits we get from mulch is it helps protect from mechanical damage. I didn't mention that one earlier, but the mulch has a breakdown, improves soil, ease of maintenance, prevents water loss, temperature coal, and the aesthetics with it. So when we're thinking about selecting mulch, um, these are some of the things that we need to consider is aesthetics. All different types of mulch have different aesthetic, qu aesthetic qualities to them. Um, but then you also think about longevity and durability. How long will that mulch be there? How often do you need to replace it? Um, and then also you need to think about the sources. Where does it come from? How available is it? How much does it cost? Um, and then that decomposition rate, some can break down so quickly, it comes back to that longevity. Uh, it can break down so quickly that that replacement might occur um, very frequently. And actually your mulch can actually influence your soil chemistry a little bit, that soil pH a little bit. Um, but you always have to be careful because some of these if not chosen correctly can lead to a susceptibility to termites um, and attracting termites to your landscape. So um, there are a bunch of different mulch types that can work really well within our landscapes. Um, you know, pine bark, uh, wood chips that are clean wood chips from like utility where it's all chipped up. Um, leaves work wonderful. Um, you know, we, I, we don't recommend mulching up, chopping up or collecting any of your, sorry, we don't recommend collecting any of your leaves and putting them out in yard waste. Um, we actually prefer that they get mulched up and you use them as mulch or help them break down and recycle nutrients in your soil and help build um, your uh, soil organic matter. So you also can have grass clippings, utility mulch, yard waste, et cetera. But when we think about mulch, it's really important that we think about sustainable mulch sources. So I always recommend for most homeowners, anything that's pine, that is gonna be always the best. You can find it, it's easy, um, it's cheap. Um, and I prefer pine needles. Pine needles I really like because 
pine bark, when it rains, has a tendency to run off. It can float off and you have to go out and you rake it up or whatever and you put it back in the bed. Pine needles, a little uh, one needle clump on its own, one little needle can float on water, but once you lay them down, they create a nice little bed, a nice little mat. Um, and um, that uh, allows them to hold together. So water just kind of flows right over them and doesn't have any um, issues at all. So it's really nice. Um, and it kind of stays put. The only drawback of using the pine needles is um, it might break, it's going to break down a little bit quicker. So you might have to replace it more frequently, not too terribly frequently. I know some people just do it once a year, some people do it twice a year. I know some people they'll just do it every few years, but you are definitely going to have to do it more frequent than you do pine bark nonetheless. But there are some mulch sources or types of mulch that we do not recommend at all because when we're choosing mulch, we need to make sure that we're picking a mulch that is sustainably harvested or it's a sustainable mulch. A lot of our mulches that you can go to the store right now and buy are not sustainably harvested. And some of those are going to be cedar. Cedar and cypress um, mulch, don't buy them. Don't buy them all. Don't buy the dyed mulches. Get some of our, the most preferred is going to be our pine needle, pine bark. You can also get like eucalyptus and malaleuca. Those are always really great. If you can get the utility waste, that works. The utility yard waste that's chipped up, that works well as also. Um, and I know that some um, HOAs, they may say you have to have a specific um, mulch type. And that's totally fine as long as it's not the cedar or cypress, those unsustainable mulches. But say you, have, you live in a community where they want you to have specifically, specifically have pine bark, but, it, but you have a lot of leaves and leaves are wonderful for mulch because they'll break down and they'll help feed nutrients and build up organic matter in that soil. You can always put your leaves out and then just put a thin layer of uh, pine bark on top of it. <laughs> so um, you can always mix um, you can always mix them in. And the great point that just came up, leaves and pine needles can bring in weed seeds. So you do have to be careful. So it's always nice that, yes, you can go out and you can clean up and pick up a lot of the pine needles and leaves in your yard and they work well, but you just have to be very careful of what you're picking up. And then I also don't recommend just getting um, just random collection of yard waste that you can use as mulch because you don't know what's inside of it. Um, even pathogens can spread through mulch. So I always recommend making sure you get good, clean mulch. And usually what you can get at the store, pine needles are just getting big bales, works well. Um, but if you're just harvesting it from around your yard, it's 100% fine. But just make sure that you're careful of what you are picking up because you can unintentionally pick up some weeds. That's a good point. So when we talk about that applying mulch, uh, we're thinking about a two to three inch mulch depth. Um, and that's like after it's settling. And then also make sure it stays a, an inch or two away from the base of our shrubs or trees. So on the image on the left, that's a great example of volcano mulching. That is a big no-no. Volcano mulching, essentially that mulch will pile up against the trunk of the tree or the shrub and it holds moisture up against that tree our shrub and as that moisture is held there it starts to break down and rot and it can actually significantly uh, shorten the lifespan of the tree or shrub so we you want that two to three inch layer kind of nice and low keep it a little bit pulled away from the trunk that one to two inches and then um that's all you really need um it doesn't need to be um Sorry, it doesn't need to have that big thick piled up against uh, the tree because that's going to cause some big issues. With some trees, um, you do want that thin layer and you could put like a, a ring, almost like a donut ring of mulch that you pile up a little bit deeper around the edge of the root ball when you plant a new tree. Uh, but um, the biggest thing is just making sure that the mulch is not up against that trunk of that tree or that shrub. So. And again, two to three inch mulch depth or just use your finger and that's good. So uh, let's go on to the seventh principle, we'll jump into more details because uh, I wanna make sure we have enough time for questions at the end. Uh, and principle number seven is recycle. So how do we recycle yard waste? 
Um, so yard waste, you know, we're collecting all of these things throughout our yard, which is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And, you know, you can go out and you'll see people bag up their uh, grass clippings or leaves, et cetera. But that is gold. That stuff is wonderful gold. So if you think about, you know, all those plants that you have in your landscapes, they're uptaking nutrients and moistures and they're growing and they're putting all that nutrient and energy into that new growth. And then what happens is you go out and you cut it and then you remove it. All of a sudden you're removing those nutrients, removing that value uh, that you have within the landscape and you're taking it away, which will require inputs regardless, additional inputs. So if we have the ability to just keep that cycling we can help build our soil or we can help build organic matter within our landscapes. So we'll, let's talk a little bit of ways that we can essentially recycle yard waste very effectively within our landscapes. So, um, so mowing is a great opportunity. So whenever you're mowing, um, don't bag your clippings at all just mulch it. You just mow it and just let it lie. Anything that goes into the roadway, sidewalk, et cetera, blow it back into your yard. Because anything that you pick up with your, um, anything that you pick up, sorry, in your, yeah, and keep within your landscape, again, it's going to break down. It's going to help build organic matter. It's going to help with that nutrient retention. So um, also when you're thinking about pruning, there's ways that you can then collect those leaves, um, assuming they're not diseased because you don't want to put anything diseased back in your landscape, but you can collect any of the stuff that you're removing from pruning and you can actually end up taking it and it can become part of your compost potentially, or you can put them as uh, brush piles in your yard if you have a large space because that's actually creates a really nice wildlife habitat. Um, it does take a little bit longer for that stuff to break down, but as it breaks down, that actually can help really create a very nice nutrient-rich soil in those areas where you allow it to uh, slowly break down itself. So uh, raking. So when we think about raking within our landscapes, you know, you can go out and you can rake up leaves, but don't bag up the leaves and get rid of them. Use those leaves. You can take that into a composter or a composting, or you can take them in your landscape bed so they can use them as mulch so they can break down. Or I know some people that will take their, uh, they will take their leaves. And I've seen somebody put it in like a big um, drum before and they have like a string trimmer that they put in there and they break it all down and they chip it up into small little fine pieces. And then they kind of just spread that around um, different parts of their landscape. So it can then end up breaking down and building that soil. So raking, you know, just part of one of our normal or what can be one part of our normal landscape maintenance, we need to think about a little bit differently than if we were just taking leads and bagging them up. We need to think about how we can make sure that we, through that, we can maintain our yard. So usually in our turf grass, if you have leaves, just mow it. That's the best and easiest thing to do is just mow the leaves and let that mulch it and then that'll settle down in the soil. And that won't accumulate thatch. If um, that's a common question is, Will that accumulate thatch within my uh, turf grass? No, it will not. And then lastly, we have composting. Composting is always the easiest way to think about how we're using our nutrients. So you can take a lot of these carbon um, and nitrogen rich elements and we can mix them together through things within our landscapes. And you can even bring in some food scraps from inside the kitchen if you wanted to. Some, not all, you gotta be careful. But um, what you can do is with these landscape materials, you can help compost them and create this really nice nutrient-rich soil that you can bring into your organic, sorry, bring into your landscape beds, you can bring into your vegetable gardens. It can really help uh, kickstart your garden because you're bringing in that really rich nutrients and that uh, really nice healthy soil into that landscape or that organic matter. Um, and one thing that we're starting to do more so is looking at how compost can be used as a really nice soil amendment in uh, how we're managing turf grass. So whenever we're thinking about soils and we mentioned soil amendments to help build soil, you know, there's a lot of things that you can add like um, you know, peat moss used to be one that we would recommend, but we no longer really recommend it because it's not sustainably harvested. Uh, but you can bring in, I know people will bring in uh, like bone meal, fish meal, worm castings, all these crazy things that they can mend. And it's actually 
nice to have within your garden, but the compost is very valuable. And compost is one of those soil amendments that you can add to help build your healthy soil. And that's not necessarily just within the uh, landscape beds. We're also seeing it being used now within turf grass and, re and turf grass maintenance. And UF is doing some research on it where we've actually found that if we do top dressing with compost, like spread a thin layer of compost around our turf grass areas, that we see early green up and better soil moisture retention within our turf grass landscapes. And it has helped with that nutrient availability and helps build a healthier soil. So we're doing research to see how can we write that in as a recommendation so it might end up being a normal way that we manage our landscapes and can reduce our fertilizer inputs or fertilizer applications. So a lot of cool research that's going on with it, but it's developing some really cool results. So um, obviously keep your eye on that one, but compost is becoming a very powerful tool and we're luckily seeing it start to be grown or produced at a commercial level where usually most composting was done at you know, someone's backyard to a certain extent. So um, just keep your eye on that one because that's a really gonna be something really cool that we see in the future. Because you know we may not have the capacity to compost in our yard, but we can end up getting to the point where we can buy really nice high level compost commercially because I think the only commercial brand that we can get right now of compost is black cow manure, which is just compost and manure. Um, but looking at other varieties and types and seeing how we can use it at a much larger scale is going to be really interesting. So anyways, so we talked about these three big principles, right plant, right place, mulch, and recycle. Because our goal is to think about the importance of Florida soils. We are directly linked to Florida's aquifers and our water resources. And in the Florida Family Landscaping Program, we want to think about how we can conserve and use Florida's natural resources or protect Florida's natural resources. And in our landscapes, we have the ability to do that by managing our landscapes properly. And when we manage our landscapes properly and even think about soil and the importance of soil in that landscape management, it can help with that right plant, right place, selecting the proper plants that want to grow naturally and thrive because that can reduce our inputs and our maintenance. By thinking about the other practices like mulching and recycling, we can use that to our ability to help build that soil, create a stronger soil. So rather than just having just bare sterile sand, you know, we're thinking about how do we bring a more robustness to our soil to help build a healthier soil so that makes sure that we are um, creating a ha happier, healthier environment for our plants to thrive in. So then we don't have to do as much inputs and we're using it consciously within our landscapes. So our soil is so important from our landscapes. So if we think about the soils from the ground up, we have the ability to have a very healthy, happy landscape. By and this all fits within these nine principles of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. So looping back around, here we are, we're back at these essential questions. So these essential questions is what is that Florida Friendly Landscaping Program? Those are those nine principles that we use from a statewide perspective on how we can manage our landscape sustainably. But why is soil important in a landscape? That's where we talked about soil's ability to help impact uh, soil pH, soil moisture retention, that cation exchange capacity. So it has the ability to support and really support all the things that are growing in our landscapes. So soil is vital, especially when we think about that power of that organic layer within the soil. And then we talked about those ways to improve soil in our landscapes through that recycling and that mulching and you know following right plant, right place. So you should comfortably be able to answer these three big questions. I know we covered a lot in a short period of time, but we have time for some questions and you can always reach out to me and what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow up with everybody with a copy of the presentation and some of the additional resources and links that were part of today's presentation. But anyways, uh, thank you all so much and um, we'll open the floor for some questions and I do have a survey that I'm going to be sending to everybody um, in a in the chat box in a few moments. So feel free to put your questions in and I'll follow up with all this information. Thank you all. What to you was the most surprising thing that you learned during this program? And you can put that in the chat box too.
Yeah, cations. Cations, it's 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 a neat thing. <laughs> I know that video, it's like that like sums it all up. <laughs> our goal is like, how do we just build our soil, help increase this cation exchange capacity? Um, because once we think about that, that makes us maybe think a little bit differently than how we're using makes us think differently um in our or different. Yeah, it makes us think a little bit differently about our soils. Blech. It's a hard time thinking. <laughs> and I'll send everybody um, that link of that video too as well. So I put in the chat box the survey link for today's program, and I'll go ahead and stop share. Let's go ahead and take a few minutes to fill all that out. Um, and um, it should just take like one or two moments, but fill that out. And I have, um, I'll go ahead and stop recording. And